So good morning to you all for coming out to the World Dharma Forum. And uh, for those of you who are tuning in from wherever you are in the world, from my heart to yours, thank you for taking a moment to cross the digital galaxy of time and space to a favorite word of mine is to commune, digitally commune, photonically commune, psychically commune, existentially commune, biologically commune, in this interactive hyperspace of, could I even use the word trans time? Is there a possibility? There are words in Sanskrit for trans time, you know, nirvana. Nibbana in the Pali Buddhist language, perhaps the most fascinating trans concept ever to originate in modernity in the last four, five, six, seven, ten thousand years. Uh, I would only encourage you if you're excited by freedom, not so much Burmese culture or Indian culture but by freedom, the oxygen that allows us uh, right now to be animated, right? Animated, biologically animated, psychically animated. What does that mean? It means that we have senses and consciousness and a body that's contextually in this inseparable interrelatedness of LIFE. And that tapestry has been so intimately looked at by ancient cultures, and they bequeathed modernity, us, you and me, at least I feel humbled by the word nirvana and nibbana, perhaps the most diamondistic, if there is such a concept, the radiance of the most transconceptual, I would like to think, experience of living within the radiance of freedom. That's the essence of why I feel I'm alive today here in Bali. And the essence of what I would call my Dharma life, favorite phrase of mine, and, or more accurately, my Dhamma life. Those two words are almost the same but there's some distinction. So anyway, by the way, the World Dharma Forum Bali. Namaste, thank you for being here. We'll have a chance when I just sort of drop back into a more relational space, a chance to talk, and question isn't about questions and answers for me, it's about the, the breathtaking challenge and intimacy of human interaction. And I must say that because of my history with meditation and psychedelics and just simply keeping alive in my humble way the beauty of wonderment and awe, I feel that my context isn't just global or environmental or, for the lack of better terms, embodied, but a hyper-relationship to invisible contexts except if you are more inclined towards the psychic intuitive, and then it becomes very intimately felt, right? Intimately felt. To open ourselves meditatively, psychedelically, femininely, divinely, to multiplicities of intelligences. And that fascinates me to take the resolving the existential conundrum out of the Dharma. You know, as a kind of closet Buddhist, the first noble truth of the Buddhist teaching, the truth of inherent stress, anxiety, difficulty, the truth of suffering, dukkha. And you can spend a lifetime learning the art of letting go or overcoming, but as my beautiful teachers that have passed on, often encouraged me and friends and others who kind of in our own humble, arrogant ways made our 
way to Asia and to these radical environments called monasteries and ashrams. We were able to exchange with these women and these men who had dedicated their lives to the evolution, the felt evolution of the Dharma, trans-Buddhist, trans-Hindu, trans-Vedanta, the felt cognitive, intelligent transformation of consciousness. That to me is my religion. And within that, the radiance of it, you know, I don't know about you, but right now I really appreciate that I'm breathing. And without the breathing to state something so obvious, uncliched, there's no seeming life as we know it. And so for me, the deeper kind of psychical, anatomical presence of my dharma, to just shift from biological identity to psychical identity to dharma identity, is the oxygen of freedom. I don't, I don't know about you, but I'm very growing more and more intolerant of self-generated, self-generated, self-generated suffering. There's enough in the outer world as a former, you know, independent journalist in war zones, seeing murder and rockets and guns up close. The outside is despicable in lots of ways. It's not the only variation on God's theme, but evil is very real. I've seen it up close. And so self-generated suffering rather than what looks to be externally instigated suffering. You know, I didn't start the war in Bosnia. I didn't start the war in Burma. But I have colluded with the war in my own consciousness, if you know what I mean. The war between good and bad, right and wrong, love and hate, generosity and stinginess. And it's been a very noble war. And the Dharma war of it, the most important spiritual war of our life, is a very convulsive, peaceful engagement. It's a very revolutionary energy. It's not violent, but at times I feel that I'm taken to my edges with that. And so the oxygen of consciousness for me in my psychical revolution is freedom. And I cannot treasure it more. So the World Dharma Forum, which I'm going to instigate over the coming months, wherever I find myself, should I continue to be alive, is going to be in a short little opening sharing to open the parameters of discussion and then interact in a way that's completely within your integrity and my integrity. And somehow in that, I don't want to impose synergy. That, that, that implies that we're going to connect. I don't want to impose intimacy and connection, especially with people I don't know very well or at all, right? Fair enough. Nor even know myself well enough to trust that I can say that I can be intimately available to someone who's perhaps even wiser and more clear and even who, God forbid, someone comes to see me and hangs and who's enlightened. I would love to meet her and love to meet him and have a dialogue about that experience if they'd be so humble. So halfway through this opening, one thing that came to mind this morning that I felt was very crucial for me to understand and remember was this distinction in classical etymological, esoteric, trans-Buddhistic, Burmese-style Dhamma or Dharma is there's the world of ideation, time and gender and labels and, you know, the ocean is one idea you can't swim in the idea. You can ideate in the projection of the ocean being something in your mind, but it does nothing to wash your face with water, the felt experience of water and moisture and warmth on your skin. The distinction here is the ideation of something and then the direct experience of something. And so you can call it the conceptual realm 
and then there's the cognitive coding realm. We're in a cognitive phenomenology. So Dharma here, Dhamma is the felt, embodied, mindful exploration, functional study of consciousness. To me, call me a 60s maverick or overly psychedelicized, I don't think so. It's really when you look, pause, coming to the end, if you don't look at your own mind, you live through the lens of other often. And then you abscond from the greatest jewelry that I feel that one can wear is self-responsibility. Set aside the word self and what that means, but self-responsibility is like over the top, beautiful. That there can be a vocation of choice and mindfulness and discernment and patience and compassion and empathy that you can work with your artistry of your own identity and that self-responsibility. I can be my own Dharma artist of consciousness. So when you take the religion out of consciousness and the vocation and the work and the consumerism and the patriarchy and the capitalism out of consciousness, that commodification of consciousness, you replace it for me with the aesthetics of artistry. I'm an artist, I'm not a student of the Dharma. So, wow, living is about the Dharma artistry of freedom. Does that make sense? Wow, I've got a job now that's so cool, so rad, so open-hearted. I can go anywhere in the world and belong to the trans cult of universal freedom. Beyond all religions, beyond all spirituality. There were few men and women who really understood there is something beyond the ism. It's the study of felt embodiment the study of felt embodiment. And I'm going to close here with an equation, two equations. I'm really into the acronym equation. Last week I spoke about the, and I'm not referring to existential urine, PPP. Prioritize, Alan, your personal peace. To me that allows me to overcome the inherent conditioning of projection. To me, if I were to use the word, and I don't like to villainize consciousness, projection known as papancha in Buddhist Pali, saturating ideation with deep conditioned beliefs and ideas and memory and emotionality. So you swim in the cinematic projection of projection. And in that illusory reality that's so tangible, it bleeds, it oozes, it takes babies out of the womb, it kills, it massacres, it rapes. But is there really a distinction between Canada and America, really, not satirically? Can you go to that border and say, this is where Canada begins and ends and America begins and ends? It's an illusion, it's an ideation. It's an agreed upon set of ideas by women and men in modernity. I think the earliest protests in England were the Calendar Reform Act. I think in 1620 they arbitrarily took 10 days off the calendar. And one of the largest demonstrations in England's history, we want our 10 days back. There's no such thing as those days. Ideation versus the felt embodiment of the functions and the textures of consciousness. People have asked me for 50 years, what do you do when you meditate? the mindful felt embodiment of the textures of consciousness as they function either to provide unknowingly or barely visible self-generated conflict and or the release of that conflict or the preoccupation in the radiance or the beautification of freedom. So, stopping. The distinction between ideation and people ask, what did you learn in a monastery? The first thing we learned was how well do you occupy your felt relationship to dignity and habit? The equation I equals the 
Now time wisdom, NTW, I equals NTW. To inhabit, what does it mean to embody? It means to inhabit. But embodiment is not really the right word. It's a bit of a linguistic pretense, if you will. It doesn't really accurately experience what's meant by being embodied. It kind of implies somatic relationships, sensation-based relationships. But so much of the Dharma is not just physical sensations, it's cognitive functionalities. And they're nearly invisible. Where is the emotionality of love right now? It's a felt but you can easily misinterpret that felt reality by cognitive bias. You could assume that it's love and it's really just your fear and attachment. You both have joy. So the I equals now time wisdom, NTW. How well do we have eyes that see other, but how well do we see consciousness. That's meditation. Feel consciousness. Know that which is present in consciousness. That's W, the wisdom truth. Because, oh wow, then I can begin to see how these states configure to either unknowingly create tension in the mind and body, anxiety and stress is the result, I think, of, of ignorance in relationship to the coding of consciousness, self-responsibility. And really being there, how am I creating, I dare say it, my reality? Self-responsibility. There could be lots of multiple realities, but what I have semi-control of is what looks to be with inside of my own mind. The context, the inner environment of consciousness. And so the I equals now time wisdom. Obviously, there's many things to consider about the now, the futuristic now, the unborn. A woman intrinsically knows that being in the moment isn't the only thing in life. It's the evolution of her child's life. She's thinking of forward moving nows, not just baby feeding on my nipple here and now, and the felt sensation only of that. Yes, I can be in the tsunami of life, but at the same time, I'd like to see a calm ocean, a future that's sacred. She has far reaching belief systems. That's a beautiful, but wisdom. And that's the operative word for me, and I'll close here. Freedom has a wisdom component that very few people seem to have a relationship to. It's easy to be in the ecstatic dance of existential music when the music is felt to be beautiful. But to be in some form of Rumi-esque existential dance in the face of evil is epic challenge. Epic beyond imagination. There are those, though, who have done that and are doing it at this very moment. Many of you know I've had a study over the last 35 years of prisoners of conscience, political prisoners. One of my closest friends, Aung San Suu Kyi, the Nobel Peace Laureate in Burma, at this very moment is in a prison cell several thousand miles from here, alone. Her body's infested with insect bites, and she's a student of my teacher. We share the same teacher who taught us many of the things that I'm sharing today. She's aware of self-generated suffering. The aesthetics of consciousness. How do you be free when you're being tortured? How do you be free when you've lost family in a genocide? It's natural, obviously, to be traumatized and grieve, but the existential spiritual dharma dance, that's what we're taking up right now. That's what we're taking up right now. So freedom, I cannot imagine something more important to me to preserve for the unborn, to elevate to the future of life than universal human rights and a universal dharma that I call world dharma. Trans, 
continent, trans-religious, trans-spiritual, to normalize the study of felt consciousness for the sake of freedom could not be more important, I feel, at this precipice of time. Here in world time, June 4th in Bali, 2023, to include every sound, every feeling, every politic, and be so revolutionary in your own artistry that you hold yourself accountable to the preservation and the elevation of freedom. Make a vow, what we call in Buddhism an aditant. I make my life to be in service of the evolution of freedom inside of one's own consciousness and the freedom of others in this context. And I pray that we have the capacity to have some degree of empathy and compassion and far reaching wisdom to consider right now the unborn. Imagine right now how many years? Two years feels like in, it could be 200 years. But imagine 500 years from now, Earth will be here, there'll be humans, there'll be animals, there'll be trees, who knows what it'll look like. It could be one artificial jungle. But imagine those boys and girls and squirrels and birds and flowers and deities and angels and even those who are the Klaus Schwab's of the future, the Biden's of the future, the Trump's of the future, the Trudeau's of the future, the Xi Jinping's of the future, the Putin's of the future, the evildoers of the future, whoever they may be, they're thinking about us right now and saying thank you for preserving in your own humble way the unthinkable timeless quality of existential, human, biological, cognitive, neurological, psychological, spiritual, trans-spiritual, galactic, whatever you want to call it, nuministic, the oxygen of infinity. The only offset of evil for me is that the radiance of freedom. And I know it in myself by the PPP formula, the preservation of personal peace, the difference between when my heart and mind and body are peaceful and when it's enmeshed with configurations of blame and judgment and anger and are immeasurably different. There I know the value of the Dhamma or the Dharma. I can decode that confluence where I'm colluding with Mara. Namaste. That's what it means. I see the God in you and I release my configuration from blaming you and harming me. Self-responsibility. So that's my little wrap today. Questions that you might have? Take your time. Let it sink. Anything goes. Otherwise, if there's a topic you want to talk about, I'm happy to just rave on for a minute or two. But if there are questions, take a moment. Jasmine, please. It's, as I hear your question, which I couldn't repeat, but I can feel it, and that's a very important form of resonance for me, to feel you, feel the question. And the answer is not an answer to you, it's just my intimate response to communion. So obviously, as a wise woman, take what resonates and discern to leave the rest. What I hear is learning the functions, the gradations, the spectrums, the manifestations of consciousness, the concomitants of consciousness, those particular elements of consciousness that normally are used with linguistic definitions through Webster. 
on a dharmic meditative level, we need to authenticate those etymological vibrations on a felt cognitive level. That's meditation. That's dhamma. Authenticate states of consciousness through repeated association with their felt study. Then we become known as dharma literate. Dhamma literate. That's the trans-spiritual, trans-religious, simple definition of meditation or dharma in interior action. You get, you get that, right? And you could immediately make an association with that's artistry. You're an artist. I'm an artist. We're all artists of life. Some of us stumble, and that's art. And some of us masterpiece. I don't know, not me, but how well do you co-create with these cognitive energetics and that's red no 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 Alan that's yellow you know you've got a you're you're sincere but you're somewhat misguided in the relationship of identification what i just pointed to is known as the color of moha delusion and it's very difficult to see what you don't know until you know through experience that that isn't it. Love is not attachment. You can do all you want to associate with it as such. It doesn't make it love among the wise or the more of the semi masteresses of dharma inner artistry and we have to really realize i know you do that there are those who really do art in a way that blows the heart wide open into majestic states there's others that are kind of finger painting and there's artistry there where are you inside with the study of felt relationships 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 how much do you meditate in the study of felt relationships, which doesn't mean to sit and close your eyes. Most of the Buddhist discourses are of men and women, boys and men, elders and youth, devas and deities, angels and demons, who are just simply listening with the fullness of their being. And that to me is a very, very fine art, to live in the vocation and the vocalization of freedom as a felt embodied experience. Ah, what's wrong with you being in your voice and studying tonality? Most of us live in a kind of, you know, flesh puppeting kind of conformity, unknown that that isn't really a static dance. You look like a piece of wood, girl. You know, being dangled by the puppets of forced vaccination. You don't realize your immune system is collapsing in on your own stupidity, bitch. Or dude. You know, not to look misogynistic. And you don't realize, oh my God, look at out there how easy it is to criticize. One of the hardest states of mind for me is to reclaim projection. Reclaim projection. Reclaim papancha. Ideate, ideate. No. Seeing, feeling. How to stay within the mind and body on a felt artist's level of this is a mindful recognition of what? Back to what I was saying in Burma, when we meditate, how well do you occupy your dignity and then how well do you occupy the colors on your interior palette? Don't just talk to me. Talk to me about what you feel and see and know inside of your color spectrum. How many Westerners, Americans especially, talk from the spectrum, I'm enlightened? And it was like, what? Teachers in Burma were like, what the fuck, dude? You want to put the color of enlightenment on the table here? Go for it. And he would, they would ask, what do you mean by that? And you wouldn't believe the stories. You know from Ramana Maharshi's ashram, right? The stories and the fabrications. It was like right out of a edited version of like crap metaverse it wasn't even like a good first take of a crap film it was like i smoked some pot and got still (laughs) 
Uh, were you in the Peace Corps in like 1910? I mean, there's things called LSD and psilocybin and ketamine and iboga and you know DMT. They like really do something to that marijuana effect. I did some DMT. Oh, I'm not enlightened anymore, but I'm so enlightened, I'm omnipotent. The American mind, right? You must have seen this so many times with Ramana Maharshi, right? Papa G and all those people. So many. I am not that and I am that, right? Uh, next. Give me another version of that. It ain't capitalism, girl. So you got to learn to mock yourself. How do you do that in a way that's elegant? Mock yourself elegantly. What's that state of mind? In Buddhism, we call it sanvega, S-A-N-V-E-G-A, urgency to stop being complicit with my mediocrity. Fuck all, man. I'm stopping the cult of healing. I'm going to be a beautiful flower radiating to the radiance of my light, my nutrients. I'm going to struggle forth, keeping my scars, keeping my superpowers. I'm keeping all of what you call I need to heal. I'm stopping the cult of looking back to be present. That's a very important insight. What is the quality of insight? How many teachers I studied with in Burma would ask, you know, they have an insight. What did you learn from what you feel? And they would ask the question, how do you know that that's an insight versus uh, a conditioned, like what you brought up, a conditioned overlay? Now that you bring it up, I don't know. What they would say? Look slash feel more carefully. That, that is called, to me, I call that existential courage, the EC equation. Existential courage, spiritual courage, dharma courage. And if we knew that quality of consciousness on the palette of our interiority, I could go there pretty much any time to retrieve projection, bring in existential courage, and the art, which you have intrinsically, perhaps all of you as women, more than I do, intrinsically bring in feeling capacity, FC. That's mindfulness. Saturate consciousness with mindful awareness that keeps feeling, keeps seeing, take notes, keep the empiricist alive, not the outcome, the capitalist outcome. It's like this is hyper-tantra. It's not just when you're being intimate, it's a, it's a cognitive relationship to suspend outcome. No pun intended. And that's, it's all an interior art, but it doesn't exclude touch, sensuality. The, the sensuality of eye contact, really? The way people look at you. I mean, it's very invasive to make eye contact. It's, it's way overrated. It shouldn't be done. It should be invited. It should be, you should gradually know how to rhythm. You know, like when you're dancing, you're constantly, you know, I'm a, I'm a beacon of light, girl. Look at me. And if you don't make eye contact, you're a loser, especially in Ubud. You know, I'm overcoming my trauma with eye contact. I'm going to download it on you. That's called solo polyamory, right? <laughs> I just losing. I'm practicing for my yoga barn show, June 14th. Come out to yoga barn. I'm offering it freely. Bless Megan and the people at yoga barn right next door here. June 14th on my website, on Instagram, on Facebook. Free tickets for the first hundred people. Please come out. So that's just a spontaneous rave and I would just invite a lifelong dialogue for you and I about these things and other things so that we're in co-evolution together in our artistry. You learn from me, I learn from you, and the deities learn from both of us. But salient point, it's so challenging and I've seen so many thousands of people over the years, not tens but thousands, how to ignite that inner revolution Aung San Suu Kyi in Burma called the revolution of the spirit, another word for Dharma life, where an individual, ah, I want to learn the ancient 
timeless present art of the felt study of emotionality and psychology and existentialism in an intersecting presence called now. And you want to infuse that with Dharma artistry and your own unique sense of aesthetic. And I use the word aesthetic here as both style and inherently the beautification of consciousness. And that takes the pressure off of overcoming what looks to be childhood wounding, existential wounding, I mean, with the word bhavana, the beautification of consciousness. Wow, wow, that's really cool that I can become a savant with my own unique relationship to the aesthetics of my body, my style, my sexuality, my sensuality, and even your own unique expression of dharma overcoming self-generated conflict. There's a style inherent in the dignity of how you cry. Political prisoners would tell me the way we ate food became more nutritious than the dog food they fed us. Think of that relationship to interiority. The way that we inhabited our breath was more important than the even breathing because they could take it from us at any minute, kill us. That level of radiant beauty, I am breathing, is enough, not that I need to breathe again. Take the conflict out of life. Take the death out of the breath. That was a constant thing that we were encouraged to do. Take the dying out of living. And then you beat God and Goddess at his and her Mara game. That makes sense? That's the synonym for, I think, the Pali Buddhist word Arhant, and what I would call transunity consciousness, like hyper non dual. It's taking the conditions of suffering out of consciousness. And that to me, without that, we're in a lockstep dance horror show with what I would call existence. There's no way that you can outrun the possibility of circumstances turning against your happiness and security. Ask Anne Frank. Ask the people in Burma undergoing a genocide right now, whereas two years ago, it was a democracy. Just like that. Whoa, whoa, right? The just like that factor. So peace, the prioritizing personal peace, I added yesterday to a friend, at all costs, elevate, sanctify, beautify, enhance, your peace, because from peace, there's a foundational, that's the palette that you can put colors on and not spill everything and not wobble and not enmesh and not, you know, young boys and girls in Burma, they would ask them as nuns and monks, because they would come in the summer, like, sir, why isn't attachment a good state of mind? It's not that it's bad, they would say, but go ahead and lean against the wall and put your feet out. And so they would have them like this, and they would say, are you happy? So, well, I'm happy as long as there's the pillar. Can you control the pillar? No, but it's pretty sturdy. It's my mom and dad. But there's going to come a point where you need to get into the sturdiness of your own solidity, your own solidarity. And that existence becomes the pillar of dignity the pillar of mindfulness, the pillar of the trans pillar of awakening, whatever that means to you. That vocation, to me, makes me family with someone. I don't want to sound arrogant, but I'm inherently arrogant by birth. And I think it's a virtue to have some kind of stealth in you that says no. It's, I think it's a, a Western overlay for the commodification of healing, to call narcissism wrong, arrogance wrong, pathology wrong, 
the vilification of consciousness, the medical illness industry, the myth of psychotherapy, the myth of psychiatry, the myth of mental illness, blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. I don't buy that kind of that, that linguistic, jargonistic incarceration for money. You imprison people in your own inability to think out of the box of commodification and patriarchy and capitalism. It's not an issue of illness. The circumstances is an inherently bad design every minute, every second of existence. And there's no way to outrun the Anne Frank thing. There's no safety except through freedom of I'm willing to look at every condition, everywhere, at all times and all postures, and liberate from the belief that I'm safe. There's relative safety, but those who are in the Dharma world, right out of nowhere, the womb jumps out at you and says, guess what? You healed? You thought you healed? Take this one on. Ask the Tibetan nuns in Tibet right now being raped by Chinese soldiers. They take refuge in Buddhang Saranangachami, Dhammang Saranangachami. I take refuge in awakening, not in external conditions of perceived safety. Relative truths. But in this day and time with artificial intelligence and the overlords in Silicon Valley and Wall Street and Davos and, you know, we can't even trust an elected leader to be a democratically awake individual anymore. That's so obvious, even kids know that. So we've got to learn to decode misinformation called information fact-finding truth. The lying zealots in Orwellianism have co-opted the ultimate totalitarian tricks and want to inflict maximum obedience among even the discerning. Whoa. Whoa, I refuse mind control. You brought up discernment. Could there be a more precious quality today than choice making, patient, wise discernment? In fact, next Sunday, I'm going to do a week long study on that quality and try to bring some clarity to it. So thank you for your question. Is there anything else that you want to ask or talk about? Don't hesitate. Simple, deep, personal topics. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I would, you know, this thing, this linguistic pretensions is a very important two words for me now. And it applies to political pretensions, obviously within the spiritual, psychological, psychedelic, so-called healing of wound and trauma, family systems, pretensions. And I don't mean, I'm not vilifying any of this. I'm just bringing in radical discernment because I've been on the crucifix level, as you have, friends, the last three years of this fucking pandemic. And uh, we've been vilified beyond imagination, right? And it's time for awakening, right? More and more so. We were right in the awakening and we were vilified and crucified for it. Roll up your sleeve and take one for the team. Just wait for the new iteration of The Great Awakening, the documentary film that everyone in the world should see, Mr. Biden. And, 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 and all the propaganda that's going down in the name of truth telling. Right, 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 right. You gotta be so rad today. No, you don't. They're abusive and violent in their machinations of using democracy and freedom and truth telling for their own fucking satanic motivated unrecognized fucking putrid souls no offense mara but i can see through your bullshit as many many millions of people are no longer in any way lockstepping to that paradigm of diminishment welcome to samsara right any buddhist in the world knows that it's not about you mr biden or you mr schwab or you mr trudeau or you 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 it's not about you it's about us learning the art of what women know let's talk about it not kill in the name of a lie and profit just had to get that off my chest someone's got to do the dirty work right
Someone's got to do the dirty work out here. Blame me, I'm a voodoo doll for your fucking asshole mind, okay? But don't harm me more than you harm yourself and your family by your idiot lies. Why can't we theatrically dance at the edge of a confluence where reconciliation and truth-telling is more important than me fucking cow-tailing and self-censoring to your idea of what truth should be and not be? Fuck off, right? We need more theatrical fuck-offs in the music world, in the theatrical world, in the poetry world, in the Bobby Kennedy world. Everyone vote for Robert Kennedy Jr. Yes. The man is over the top brilliant and he's just climbing the hill and he's one of the rare ones as his family has shown. He'll die on the hill for our freedom. Let's die with him or be reborn together as we climb the mountain of democracy and make it go global and viral. Not big medicine, big pharma, bullshit to all the Silicon Valley. Unelites, they're not elites, they're unelites, they're lights. They're lightweights. Just have to say the truth now and again to see if I still know it. <laughs> you know, practice in the mirror of your own FaceTime, you know? Like, what are the things that you're not sharing with your family, with your friends, with your own being? I've got a three Sunday group coming up in July called Mindfulness, Mindful Intelligence, I mean, Meditation, and what I call dosing micro levels and part of that is really the art of what I've learned over the years of, of, of self psychedelic therapy like take it off the cushion of other and learn the fine meditative cognitive emotional sensitivity of authenticating interiority through personal means or those blessed sacred savants called friends and cohorts and allies of the soul that you're not paying for to hold sacred space for you as you talk to yourself and authenticate your inner palate of self-responsibility. That is a very interior existential gym to do your workout in. You don't need to pay thousands of dollars in medical bills and does insurance cover it when you can do it at home. So the lower the amount heightens the opening, I find. It's like the less you meditate, the more awareness and insight seems to arise. My teachers in Burma used the word chronic yogis, chronic meditators, chronic dosers. We know them, right? Chronic politicians, the swamp in, poli in Washington, the swamp in psychedelic conferences, the swamp in mindfulness conferences. It's like they're just laden, no offense, just laden with capitalistic corporate, you know, Davosian energy and you can feel it. Take control of your life means to reclaim that which you give away. I'm not saying there aren't experts, but there are none. Who's an expert on stopping war? Who's an expert on consciousness? Who's the, who's, who out there really knows the why we are, who we are, where we're going? Come on now, come on. Who cannot not ask the question? That to me is the ultimate state for me today is keeping alive as, you know, the question. It's not me originating saying that, but the question, where are you still folded? And is what you're sharing truth? And how do you know the emotionality of truth in yourself? So anyway, long-winded. So anything else? Good. Please take your time. I'm totally down. I, I love the ability to be alive because it's a short-lived experience. You know, a minute or a month or a decade or a lifespan is micro, super micro. I just want to say that you're an amazing speaker and the way you string words is phenomenal for me. Yet at the same time, particularly in the beginning, before you got into your own experiences, when you were giving the whole picture, using a lot of very beautiful words and stringing them, my, I get lost. 
I get lost in the concept unless it's a concept I'm already familiar with, right? And in that, I lose connection to my inner. So when you started speaking about felt sense, to that I can completely relate. relate. It's why I stopped going to satsangs. Mm. Everybody is using concepts, correct? And my mind will overtake and then the self-judgment comes, oh, uh, I don't quite understand what they're right. talking about. Yeah, yeah. Instead, and then if I go in and I feel what I feel, which is not always positive, which I know I have a lot, as we all do, because we have the negative and the positive inside us. I'm not that familiar with Buddhist texts and all that. To me, all my life, I stayed away from it because it's so mind. It sounds, and I can get lost in it. Instead of the simple, just go inside, feel, see what quiet. What is my mind observe? I'm observing. What am I feeling? I get lost when it gets too philosophical, and because I love it so much. That's. I, I th thank you for being so exquisite in my humble estimation of hearing you. Um, what is your name, by the way? Osnatara. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. You're a very beautiful mind in my way of having lived all these decades to share that. And it touched some very interesting places in me. Um, I think if I can just share a couple of them, you know, I think a lot of what I'm feeling in myself in these rare moments, because I very rarely ever do anything publicly. It's probably the result of the, some of it's the result of the lockdowns and the pandemic. I'm a very vocal individual. I had so-called had a livelihood of being in public circumstances for decades. Uh, when the pandemic came, when I was here and in Los Angeles in lockdown, I had 15 city tour that had canceled with theater, spoken word, retreats, workshops, silent retreats in Burma where we would go for six weeks without talking. You would have liked that, Alan. <laughs> Alan, talk more. Monks and nuns, talk more. I want to know more. I'm tired of being with myself. I'm just joking. There's always a little bit. <laughs> and uh, so I hear you, and uh, as I said a little bit earlier, sort of jokingly, but it's not really, is that if I don't make my few outings really work for me, because I'm st stretching, cognitively doing my inner yoga, I've got this anti-performance coming up at Yoga Born on the 14th Wednesday night here, in which it's 65 minutes of of me sharing the most important moments of my life. Because I, I relate personally, this is my excessiveness and or wisdom, I relate as if I'm not going to live again. I, that today, right now, is it. And so I just want to trust more and more in that intuitive flow rather than thinking I need to be heard. It's kind of it's almost self-centered, but it's part of my shadow and struggle has been accommodating. And I do say the word so sparingly. I'm not a pleaser. I'm more of an asshole. And, but I can be really pleasing to people and really attentive. I've done decades of retreats. The listening capacity. I'm right there with you because I really believe and feel in the struggle of an individual's life to the point where I would almost suffer as a result of so much intimate engagement to be in other in order to feel her and him, right? You know that. I don't know whether you're a parent or not, but I'm, I'm a single dad and I, to embody my daughter's consciousness and subconscious and lifestyle, it's an amazing absence of self, right? To feel other like that. And the other thing is that I do 
in my own way. I, I won't say the word, but it starts with a P and it's spelt like the word psychedelic. Um, but I inhabit a lot of those spaces. And so I am in self-discovery a lot. I rarely socialize and see people do a lot of self-discovery through that process. And so I'm pushing boundaries inside. I'm overcoming enlightenment in three traditions, to figuratively joking. I'm overcoming my Buddhism. I'm overcoming my insight. I'm overcoming what I've known to be wisdom and going into the quantum trans woo of a white hole, not a black hole. I'm going into my singularity, the edge of my knowing to complete unknowing. I'm going into my trans artificial intelligence, which is even more intelligent than the psychedelic. How can I? learn to speak beyond my articulation. So free-flowing concepts to me become a more liberating space than communing in a way that you, I don't say this, you may want to feel what you've known to be harmony before. That you may not understand, say in my case as you're bringing up, words and emotions doesn't mean that what has been said or expressed, not that you're saying that, could have been said differently or should have been said differently. I, I know, I, I, I hear that, I'm just saying that. So I just want to make clear that your intimacy and my intimacy met where I sit, but it may not have met in the way in which we defined our lives. And that to me is naked Tantra. That to me is naked trans Buddhism, naked trans Ramana Maharshi. That naked trans is a very interesting two words for me right now because out of the box means naked trans. That means hyper vulnerable with empowered creativity, not whining and crying only as vulnerability, but just radical adventurous openness. Like I am, you're a woman, I'm a man, a woman. You, you, I want to feel, I want to live in my sexually forward presence without shame, right? Isn't that right? I want to live in my sensual, forward, sexual, erotic presence without any need to belong to your cult. That's, you don't ever say that, but you feel it. I want to not break out, but I want to feel out. That means letting go inside, kind of an orgasmic experience, for me, existential orgasm. Like, let it go, man, and stop being so clearly enunciated. Because it got you into a lot of cultural cul-de-sacs and false prophets and, and collusion with predators and evildoers. Next thing you know, it's like, wow, I'm reclaiming my independence by being kind of an idiot savant. Maybe that should be a new religion, how to overcome your certainty, how to overcome your articulation. Stop telling the same fucking stories, teacher. They're so habitual that it's no longer ha, ha, ha. It looks like you're fossilized inside, dude. And we've got enough bucks out of the mindfulness story that you're dead in the water. Okay, I'm sorry, but your religion is bankrupt. Why? Because you fell victim to making it so clear for others to hear. Same music, the same stairway to heaven. 42 years later. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm sort of going to the other side of it now. It's like, wow, great, Alan, for interrupting the familiarity of how I feel. I'm just playing with how I would love to hear people applauding me. You know, not, not the, the way that you're doing it. That you're here is enough for me to go reverence for you. So, and I could do better to relate in the moment with someone by taking into account, are we communing? Are we being heard? I could check in like that, but I'm not a therapist and I'm not a teacher. And it's not that I don't care, I do care. I easily feel hurt and rejection. No one can reject me more than I can reject myself. You know, and I have a high degree of aptitude for the quality of greatness and excellence that really holds myself accountable to words and language and feelings. And so I sometimes overemphasize 
overthink, overexpress, to make sure that I'm not living in dogma. And then it becomes like, what the fuck did you even say? And that's why I love people who are mad, crazy, so asymmetrical, depressed. I so understand suicidal ideation as high virtue. It's not a mental illness. You know, you know R.D. Lang, the famous psychiatrist, insanity is a sane response to an insane world. And Krishnamurti's famous quote that it's no measure of success to be profoundly adapted to a sick society. What does that mean on a felt level of living more inconsistency with belonging? And the more that I've gotten sensitive to the psychedelicized, mindful, disobedient edge of psyche and substratum and infinity, that multiplicity of confluences, is, and I say it, it's rather original, but not really, but I am done with thinking that life has something to offer me. You know, it doesn't mean, you, you get it, right? You, people get it. It's like, it doesn't mean I'm not going to be nice, but I'm not going to be nice, nice. Uh, nice, nice to the edge of where I'm extracting myself from the conformity of cultural belonging. I once was asked to write a book called in, back in 2002, and I had one condition. They said, what is it? And I said, what I write, you publish. I gave them the book eight months later, and they called me and said, Alan, man, you rock, dude. I knew what was coming. But you cannot be saying the things that you're saying in there and expect to make it in the West as a Dharma teacher. And I have no interest in becoming a teacher. Well, even being respected, I said, like what concepts are you bringing up? You can't say that enlightenment is a myth. <laughs> you can't be saying mental illness is a myth fabricated by the <laughs> colonialist psychiatrists, psychologists, and pseudo experts. <laughs> you, you get it, right? So you and I are connecting now, really. That's really rad to have resonance in these areas. It's like, I loved him. He was. I loved the publisher, and I loved them. I mean, although I'm not into the power of now, I think it's propaganda. Same publisher. And I think it's repressed sexuality, actually, to be quite frank, in him. It's not enlightenment. It's not a guide to enlightenment. It's a guide to my repressed sexuality. The now is not here, and it's not stillness. It's, it's, it's far more beautiful than that. Diversity, okay? Musicality, sensuality, eroticism. So how do you, if I may? How do I what? If I may stop you for a minute. Go ahead, yeah. Tibetan uh, Buddhist, Buddhism, the culture of having nuns and monks not fully embodying that side of them. What side is that? Their, their passionate sexual side, which is still human. Oh, I see what you're saying. So why don't nuns and monks fuck? That's not what, I'm not putting it that, that straight, but in the teachings of bringing those people to live that style of life, they have missed part of who they are. I see what you're saying. I, well, I think the Tibetan monks definitely engage in unthinkable sex. Behind closed doors. Super close, like yeah, in radical denial and yes, exactly. all that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. No offense to Tibet. I mean, I love Tibet and I love the Dalai Lama, but I'm not down with, you know, take one for the team kind of thing and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, I, I'm in Burma. I only know Burma and I only know a couple of monasteries. 
I can't speak for the entire Sangha, but I can speak from my experience there. Why I abstained mindfully from volitional forms of sensuality and sexuality and eroticism verbally, imaginatively, and physically as a monk and as a nun, you do that, you make a vow, is that I had an extremely healthy, sensual, erotic, sen sexual life for many years prior to becoming a monk. I never had trouble not enjoying masturbation, sexual fantasy, eroticism, I'm heterosexual with women, sensuality, cuddling, hand-holding, uh, kind of slightly deceptive non-monogamy. Didn't have quite the courage to, you know, really embody what I was doing. So, and I felt that I wanted to have a time out to see yeah. what those, let me finish please. I wanted to have a time out to see in the safety of a sacred environment where there was a commitment to that time out. That's all it is, it's a temporary time out. One of the beauties of nuns and monks in Burma that it's not forever, it's just you ordain for a week and it's totally rad. It's just a time out and it's no charge for that time out. And once you're in the space of the sacred time out, you have rules of conduct to harmonize, but also to illuminate. Like for example, we, another thing that was, we were asked, we had to commit to do was no food after 12 noon, for example. That meant watching the predilection to think that normalized hunger was then to be followed with the action of eating or drinking. So you had to watch the impulse. The same thing with intimacy, sexuality. Um, it highlighted the impulsation of psyche. It also illuminated a lot of the conditioned behavioral expressions of sensuality, eroticism and sexuality. Even the history of your memory of intimacy with partners and women and fantasy. Wow, I never knew that I could learn so much from memory and past. That's one of the things about the now is not only here, it's the, the mindfulness of the past. In fact, sati means memory, recalling more intimately and wisely that which occurred in the past now. But it's not in the now, you're not doing it, it's cognitive. So the sacred abstinence called um, Nekama, renunciation, is a sacred act of self-awakening that exceeds, for me, during the experimentation phase, hang in there, even the learning through conscious sexuality. It exceeded that. And even today, decades later, I am, quite frankly, I am so down with something for the last 10 years, which I call the sapioerotic. Is the, the turn on of sapio-oriented kink, the turn on of sapio-oriented eroticism, the turn on of sapio-oriented sexuality, of sensuality, the turn on of sapio-unreferenced awakening with eroticism and sensuality and sexuality, cognitive intimacy, and how well do you want to play and dance in that field of shared sensuality rather than physical. So it was a great learning for me to have experimented with conscious abstinence, which was not hardship. If it was hardship, nuns and monks had to leave within a day or a week. They just couldn't survive if you were repressing sexuality. It had to become an art form. So in Burma, where I learned, this is what we did. It wasn't a hardship. And there are times when you, oh my God, you look at someone who's a nun and you go, whoa, goddess, you and I have been connected for multiple lifetimes. Can I rip off your nun's robes and let's just fuck and get over this monastic story? And there are a lot of monks and nuns who transgress and they immediately confess and leave the order. Or they have fantasies like that and masturbate and then they confess in front of the Sangha and then they deal with that. It's not as if it's, but that's my answer. And so a lot of what goes on in monasteries is 
no offense, uninformed outsider's projection. Same thing with meditation. And you can see that a lot of the projection and assumptions of what meditation is has been brokered as what it is in the world. And it has nothing to do with how it was taught. No, nothing at all. I can say a little bit about that even. It's important. You know, the monastery where I lived in Rangoon, they, we called it, they called it the all posture meditation. Took all the pressure off of sitting meditation as priority over all postures. Think of that. And so it immediately brought into felt discernment how we create unrecognized forms of apartheid in our mind. This over that is apartheid. With degrees of patriarchal certainty to the point where it metastasizes into racism, xenophobia. It's just toxic patriarchy. Men taking it out on men and women and babies and children and environments. The, the, not men, men, but that Mara-esque evil. So the all posture, all times, all context, all states, and all degrees of complexity. All postures, all times, all states, all context, all degrees of complexity. It all the senses in the three streams of action, thought, speech, and action, in the three time frames before something is said, during, and after. That's meditation in the monastery where I lived. And so, whoa, it's called the, what's been co-opted, the wisdom of no escape. And so we were encouraged when we went to bed at night, which breath did you go to sleep on? And we were encouraged in the morning when you wake up, which breath did you wake up on? And teachers would arbitrarily invite. You're good, you can call for you, it's perfectly human. And if you came into the room with the teacher and you bowed, you really inhabit the bow, not the reverence to the nun. Reverence is to your self-responsibility of awakening to the felt embodied cognitive awareness of states of mind. So that was like, whoa, high premium for me. The least of the which, and I'll end here, least of which was the price was abstinence from sexuality. It's like, I heard so many songs when I meditated from the age of four or five till the time I ordained at 29 in my mind that carried on sonically that I had to relive those motherfuckers in meditation. It's like how many times when you just relax without overlaying new phenomena on consciousness, that shit just repeats sometimes and repeats and repeats and the things that you've repressed, that you thought that you forgot, all your sexual fantasies, all your proclivities, all your habits, all your disgust for teachers, all your hatred of God, all your prayers. And if you don't have a good Kalyanamita or a guide or a friend or a teacher who keeps supporting you, you know this from your time in India, I know, with the, with the savants you were with, they support your beauty. Where do you get that? I will do anything to be in this environment, to have a man and a woman and people who cry with you, who celebrate with you, and who don't collude with you. I love you more than your need to feel agreed upon here. And you go, thank you for being so intimately honest with me in such an elegant, crazy way. Could they be fierce at times? Yes. The Burmese are masters of mocking your shadow. And you learn to laugh at those who do that in such an elegant way. You know, I, 
once had a very senior monk who was a very good friend of mine, saw that I was doing walking meditation outside the, the building where I lived. And I was looking up at this incredible sunset, you know, this incredible sunset. And he walked by and kind of said, uh, why don't you write a poem, Alan? Isn't that what you Americans do? And I was like, whoa, you're fucking with my real renaissance man inside. And I went, namaste, asshole. <laughs> That's how they play, you know. Once at the well, we were outside bathing in our longies and throwing water in silence. And I could see, I was looking at him, and he had a series of scars on his chest. And I, I you can't see it, but when I was young, and then a monk, I had no hair, and I had a big scar from a car accident. And I've always had this impacted sense of shame about it. I almost killed my best friend, and I, at the time, I felt like I created an ugly monster. And so I never really reconciled that until I was in meditation. And I, could, I was looking at his scars glistening in the sun and going like, fuck, dude, I got a brother here. He's got scars all over him, he says, and he looked at me, he broke silence and says, yep, he just immediately translated, he spoke good English, what they were from. Then he explained the prognosis. He said, you know, I'm 41 now, you're 29. They tell me I'm like at the cusp of dying. He died a year later from his wounds as a child. And then he asked, what are those things from in your head? And I went, and I almost threw up. I actually felt nauseous thinking about it more of a love for him than my scars. You don't have people often that talk to you so honestly without the pretense of it being wrong or right. Just what are those scars from, dude? And I said, fucking drunk at 15 and 10 months. I went through the windshield, hit a telephone pole. Whoa, whoa, man. And he didn't use the fuck word. He said, it must have really fucking impacted your brain. And I never put it together. Never. No one, no doctor, no psychiatrist, no psychologist with the, with the migraines. It was just not neurology and trauma weren't put together then. I went, must have really fucked up your brain. And I played college football, high school football. The percussion of that, the concussions of hitting these massive men who want to kill you. It's like, and I explained to him, and it was like the opening. The monastery wasn't just about Buddhism in Burma. It was the best kept secret was a lot of my impacted shame, blame, fear, projection, lack of self-worth, because you're being validated by beautiful minds. They don't, they don't, you're not in a monastery unless you're beautiful. And you're willing to look at your scars and your wounds in a beautiful lens. That's what a monastery is. It's the practice of bhavana, the beautification of consciousness. And those who are longer in the scene embody those qualities in a type of fearless purity. That's why they become teachers in a skill set. So, thank you for your question. I'm going to politely end for today, 12.30, keep it on time. Thank you for being here. Thank all of you for tuning in wherever you're around the world. Uh, next Sunday and the following Sunday, two more Sundays. And one last time, June 14th, Wednesday, here in Bali, next door at Yoga Barn. I'm doing a sh show called Spiritually Incorrect. Uh, New Horizons, Freedom Never Dies. Extemporaneous, improvisational, satirical, somewhat comedic. Uh, esoteric, erotic adventure in spoken word that will have direct implications to politics, spirituality. My discuss with gurus and most teachers and certainly experts and uh, the abandoning of pretense, the re-envisioning of radical authenticity, um, all the things that we probably cherish in our dreams or our subconscious or with our lovers or in our imagination, like learning to really empower the high art of wonderment 
and living way out with your voice, you know, doing something radically special with your life, radically special. Not the conformity to being a mindfulness coach or a yoga coach or psychedelic assisted therapeutic coach alone, 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 alone. But really the, the wonderment, using the psychedelic and meditation and consciousness as an experience of adventure, trans wound, and unfolding the collective, the individual, the societal collusion with capitalistic domination. And how can I break free of those conformities? And I'm going to put the most important stories, which is not easy, the most important stories of my life into the sonic collective and hopefully say them one final time in a way that I've never felt and said them and retire them out of my love for the future of freedom and for the future of life. So hope you'll tune in if you're in Ubud or Bali. Um, tickets are on Yoga Barn's website. They're on my website, alanclements.com, under the events, on my Facebook page. And uh, hope to see you and thank you from my heart. Mm-mm. <clears throat>